recuperating like back into a, a normal rhythm. It's not exhausting waking up and worrying that, um, I don't know, just randomly like somebody storming the Capitol trying to overthrow the government or anything like that. Exactly. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah that is a thing, so. Um, Anyway, all right. So we, we have some some participants here. Um, if it's okay, I think we'll 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 get going. Um, I want to take a minute. Thank you, everyone, for for joining us on this new this new episode of, of Drinking with Historians. Um, I want to introduce uh, Rachel Vows. Um, she is uh, not having technical difficulties this time. She's our wonderful research assistant, and so I wanted to give her a moment to just uh, introduce herself and say hello to everybody. So Rachel, please. Hi. It's great to be here, and. Uh... It's great to say hi, hi Carlos, hi Varsha, hi Matt. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for having me and thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you very much, Rachel. I hope you you enjoy the uh, the episode from the uh, from the background, making sure that everything doesn't kind of fall apart. I'm sure I will. <laughs> yes. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, I'm gonna um, take a moment here and, and introduce our um, guest here, and um, so are we are exceptionally pleased to be um, joined by uh, Carlos Noreña, um, who's an associate professor in the Department of History at uh, UC Berkeley, um, my alma mater, where Varsha is a PhD student right now. Uh, Carlos and I were just talking about, we overlapped very, very briefly when I was a graduate student there, but I was off dissertating and doing other things, so I don't think we actually met, and so we still haven't met. I mean, we're meeting on, on online, I guess, yeah. but anyway. Like so um, many introductions today. Yeah. Like so many introductions today. That's right. I mean, it's going to be really amazing, like going to a conference and and actually meeting people um, once more, like people you you've gotten to know on Zoom and stuff like that. So yeah, but, I um, have I have a conference in October. It's in Portland, so I don't know if it's you know if the world is going to be okay by then. But if it is, I'm excited because you know I get to meet people. But also, I'm worried that I don't know how to hold a conversation in person anymore. I feel like <laughs> I've lost that talent completely. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, what is it like to be around human beings again? I don't know. I don't, We're going to find know. out, right? Yep. So, um, let me complete my introduction. Like this is this is a problem at the beginning. Like I'm so excited to actually be talking with you guys. I, I forget to do everything. So um, Carlos Marina is a, is a historian of ancient Rome. He has a wonderful first book, Imperial Ideals in the Roman West. And he's working on a whole bunch of really interesting projects about kind of the, the Atlantic frontier in the Roman world, some comparative work between ancient Rome and Han China, and all sorts of other stuff, which we will get to very shortly. But we have to start with the most important question of the night. Carlos, what are you drinking today? Well, I put a lot of thought into that, that question. Um, I initially thought I might have a gin martini, which I think is the queen of the cocktails. Uh, but in looking at some of the earlier episodes, I saw Anthea Butler's gin martini, and she set the bar so high. I said, there's no way I can compete with that. And my second possibility was this. This is a screwball whiskey. This is a peanut butter whiskey. Uh, oh. But I was afraid of offending Varsha's sensibilities, so... <laughs> that. So I thought I would try to have a black and tan and to actually, you know, to do it, to, to pour it live, like, like Bill O'Reilly will do it live. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is, I've never done it, actually. So let me see if I can get this angle properly. So, you probably know you start with a, a pale ale. I've got a Sierra Nevada uh, and a pine glass. You're supposed to pour it about halfway up. And you want a little bit, I so, so I watched a bunch of YouTube videos. So you want a bit of, <laughs> uh, and then let's see, oh, you're supposed to put a spoon over the top and then pour a Guinness from a can very slowly. And let, let's see. This is fun. Yes, but I think it might work. <laughs> Has anybody done this before, by the way? I have never. No, I have not, I'm not no. a fan of I've had of a beer. black and tan, but yes. But nobody, but nobody on the show has done it. Yeah, I don't think anyone on the show has done it either. No, no one on the show has made a black and we tan. We are in uncharted territory right here on Drinking <laughs> with Historians. 
Yes. So Ben Railton um, double fisted us with some um, some t- some tall boys um, on his episode, but uh, but never uh, uh, black and tan. Yeah. Okay. So, but, well, you know, it's let's see, let's see how I'm doing. <laughs> I, I'm gonna let it settle for a second, but I think it's it's close. It's close. Yeah. That is That's close. Not bad at all. Yeah. I'll give it a B. I'll give it a B. I'll give it a B. <laughs> Nice. A gentleman's B. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. Uh, what are you guys so what, I am having a bottle that I just found recently. I've been looking for it for a while now at like a reasonable price. It's a Yamazaki 12 year. Um, they, Japanese whiskey is just delicious. Uh, and so I've been looking for this bottle for a long time and then I finally found it and it is so good. So good. Um, yeah, Matt, are you having a fancy cocktail as well? Of course, I'm very fancy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I feel like like we're really kind of falling into um, stereotypes, Varsha. It, um, you know, with um, you know, Carlos is afraid of offending your whiskey sensibilities, and of course, I have a fancy cocktail and stuff like that. So maybe we need to break out of that and like do a gin episode one day or something. Um, yeah. I do have I do have a cocktail. The Yamazaki is amazing, by the way. Um, so I had the, good. the the good fortune of going to Japan a few years ago, um, and Japanese whiskeys are just amazing they're much cheaper in japan than they are here oddly enough um anyway um so the cocktail i have is 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 kind of a play on a manhattan is i have some dolan blanc vermouth which i got a long time ago for like it's like one of those uh uh uh, liquors that you buy to make a cocktail and then you never use it for anything and so i decided i needed to use it um so it's pretty sweet vermouth and so i just substituted it for kind of regular red sweet vermouth in a manhattan and it's quite delicious. So, uh, but for backup, I have some amazing Uncle Nearest 1856. So, um, which we'll get to in the second half when we're drunk with historians instead of drinking with historians. So, um, but I think I think the most important question that, that we have to ask Carlos, it's the question that, that I've been just dying to ask you um, since you know we knew you were coming on the show. And we said, what are your thoughts on the movie Gladiator? Uh, well, I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. Okay cinematic representations of Rome. Um, I'm also a, a, a big proponent of the HBO series, Rome. Mm. One of these historians, many of our colleagues, as you know, when they watch uh, dramatic recreations of the past, they put on their kind of scholar hat and look for mistakes. Uh, but I don't, I, I prefer to let it just to suspension of disbelief and to enjoy. Um, so I thought Gladiator was, was pretty well done. In particular, you remember all of those scenes when he's taken to North Africa and he's kind of learning how to be a gladiator? Yeah. They very effectively capture the world of the kind of provincial rinky-dink gladiatorial combat. I mean, we think of Rome and the Colosseum and the big fancy, uh, really expensive gladiatorial combats. But this was not, a gladiatorial combat was a regular feature of not quite daily life in ancient Rome, but it was it was omnipresent, and it took place you know in these small kind of um, provincial settings just as much as they did in Rome. And I thought they got that part well. Yeah, so I think that's that's really interesting because I think you know it wasn't a totally naive question, but I really do. I'm curious what people think of Gladiator, um, but you know because your research, one of your research projects that you're working on is about this idea of the Atlantic as a frontier. Right, and so I think that a lot of people, when they think of, when they think of ancient Rome, like they think of the city, right? They think of the big metropolises that are that are, you know, or maybe kind of Alexandria, or you know, later Constantinople, um, Byzantium, something like that. So, so how, like, could you talk a little bit, like, what was it like, kind of on the frontier? Like, what, how did that relate to kind of the center to the idea of empire, kind of generally, this idea of th- these these places on the far fringes. Yeah, I mean, there's been quite a shift in our understanding of life on the frontiers in the last generation, I would say. Um, this is in part through archaeological discovery. You know, students will sometimes ask, you know, what possibly could there be left to say about the Roman Empire? It's a subject of study for hundreds of years. And it's true that the literary record is, you know, finite and fixed, and people have combed through it with a fine, fine tooth comb. Um, of course, there's always new questions and new interpretations, but basically that body of evidence is fixed and is really never going to grow. 
but the archaeology is just continues to boom. I mean, there's so much excavation and reporting and publication in Roman provincial archaeology that it's actually impossible to keep up with. And so we have a much fuller picture now than we did, you know, a generation ago about life on the frontiers. And probably the biggest kind of interpretive change that this has brought about is to see life on the frontiers as very dynamic uh, and very dialogic between the people on the, on the near side, the Romans, and the non-Romans on the far side. We now know that there was all kinds of um, exchange, economic, demographic, cultural. Um, so we've really come to see the frontier areas as, as dynamic zones of activity rather than hard borders. Whether the Atlantic is part of that same system of lively frontier life, uh, that I think is still an open question. That's part of what I've been interested in pursuing. Yeah. So what is it? What, so what's different about the Atlantic then, as opposed to you know something that we might think of um, uh, maybe on the, the the Rhine frontier or something like that, or North Africa or something like that? So yeah. what what is it about the Atlantic that makes that a little bit different? Well. At a first glance, it's so different, in fact, that nobody has thought to study mm. as a frontier zone. So if you think about the Roman Empire, um, it's centered on Roman and Italy and the Mediterranean basin. And, you know, the Romans over the course of the last two centuries BCE conquer the whole perimeter of the Mediterranean basin and push out into the continental hinterlands, into what is Europe, uh, Africa, and Asia. And the directional frontiers uh, are all very different from one another. So the northern frontier, which is really defined by the Rhine and Danube rivers, um, is, a, is a kind of ecological frontier on the other side of which is a large number of different, still sometimes called them tribal groupings who are less settled and less urbanized um, than the Mediterranean core of the empire. Uh, and who represent from Roman perspective, a kind of threat to manage, which is very different from the Eastern frontier, which for most of the period of questions, let's say the first couple centuries CE, is defined mainly by the Euphrates River. And to the East, Rome faces something like a mirror image of itself, another big centralized state, yeah. another big empire, usually centered in the Iranian plateau, um, but like Rome, they have a big standing army, a monetized economy, an elaborate kind of bureaucratic government. And in a way that frontier is very stable because the two sides are, are more or less mirror images of one another. And neither side can kind of launch the sort of invasion of the other that would be destabilizing. To the south, of course, you have the Sahara Desert. That's distinctive too, because that's a little bit like the Atlantic in that it's a big ecological frontier, in this case, a desert rather than an ocean. But Roman authority in North Africa doesn't end on any kind of marked line. Mm. Uh, it sort of peters out in a kind of pre-desert zone in between the settled agricultural coastal area and the Saharan desert itself. And we now know that, um, this is actually quite recent, that there was trans-Saharan trade in the Roman period. Not so much of goods crossing the desert from one end to the other, but you know, a series of kind of interlinked nodes that do mm. represent a kind of commercial zone. But the Atlantic, of course, in antiquity, is just a big open-ended space. Uh, Romans never had the impulse or the drive to, to keep sailing westward to find what they might find. And so I think the open-endedness of that kind of edge of the empire uh, makes it different from the other three. Yeah. Interesting. So I, I have a question just because I sadly never got to take your class 106B or 106A back when I was uh, an undergrad at Berkeley. I never took Roman history or Greek history. So my, my question is, when you get students in the first day, so um, one of the professors at Berkeley who teaches British history, uh, Vernon, he will spend like the first like 20 minutes telling you why you should study British history. Like, why does it still matter? Like, why do people care about Britain? I mean, it's, you know, going down in the dumps. 
what do you tell students when they're when they're you know come into your Roman history class either for either because they're not history majors or because they're just interested in Rome? Why does Rome still matter? Well, yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, we still benefit, I think, those of us who teach Greek and Roman history from a kind of, um, I, I think students come in with a number of preconceptions about the ancient world from things like the movie Gladiator. And of course, while in general, we want to invite them to rethink preconceptions they have about Greece and Rome, and in particular to rethink the old tradition of the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. We want to problematize that from the, from the ground up. Um, we nevertheless got a lot of students who are interested just intrinsically. Um, and in many ways, I often push back against the idea that antiquity or the Roman Empire in particular is somehow pragmatically useful for the present. Um, there are ways in which it might be, but this can sometimes lead to kind of facile comparisons about, you know, the fall, the fall of the Roman Empire. Should, should we see American decline in terms of imperial decline, uh, for example, of the Roman Empire? And the diff I guess I would say I stress the differences. I, stre I stress the alienness and the foreignness of this period of history, partly to draw out the kind of exotic and romantic element of it, um, but partly also because precisely since it's so far in the past, it becomes in a way a kind of safe space to think through issues which are perennial. So whether it's questions that are at the forefront today about, for example, diversity um, or different forms of oppression, um, we can study those and talk about them freely and openly in antiquity precisely because it's so far away and, and in a sense so irrelevant to the current to the current day that it right it becomes a kind of safe space to talk about those kinds of questions. Yeah. So if I can follow up on that, I mean, one of the things I mean, you see, you mentioned this about like um, comparisons of the, the the end of the empire to the current the state of the US, right? Empires in decline, like, I mean, and there's a gazillion kind of takes on this that are happening kind of all the time. So how do you how do you kind of deal with that as a Roman historian? I mean, I think we, we all kind of all historians kind of have to do with these these kind of facile analogies sometimes, but like, how do you how do you kind of confront that? Um, you know, if I don't know, you're on a webcast and somebody asks you about that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, it's interesting in that um, I think maybe less the Roman Empire specifically, mm. but empire as such can be a useful kind of framework for people to think about the world we're in and, and arguably moving into. So I often tell students, I've never done the math on this. I don't know if this is true, but I sometimes claim that you know, more humans in world history have lived under empires than any, any other political form. Now, given the rise of the nation state in modernity and the demographic explosion of the 20th century, I don't know if that's actually quantitatively true. But in any case, many people have lived in empires. Ancient empires in particular help us to defamiliarize the present day. You know, many, so many students, many freshmen will come in taking everything about the modern nation state for granted. Yeah. They have little sense of how recent it is, in fact, or in a way how arbitrary this particular form of, of organization is. So empire gives us another way to think about, you know, sort of transnational and global phenomena um, that, that, that empire gives us a kind of a, a way to study. And I think, you know, I think in the 21st century, we're entering into, we've been in a phase of globalization for some time now. I think we're entering into another phase in which yeah. it's unclear if the nation state is going to be the kind of predominant organizational form. Yeah. And empire helps yeah, us to think through that. 
Yeah, it, it seems like I mean, I, I mean, one of the the frustrations I have oftentimes with with modernists um, is is they 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 assume these forms are are essentially timeless, like they've existed in the past. It's just they they call them something different in the past, and then they will continue into the future. And I think if anything, studying the history with sensitivity shows that, that that's absolutely not the case. Right. Um, I liked what you said kind of at the beginning too, before this is about it, you know, the, the distant past allows people to safely think about issues. And I yeah. think especially in a classroom, like that's really important for 18 to 22 year olds who are, you know, kind of working through some things in, in general. Right? So. Yeah. so I it's had a question. To the question. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, you said it was also relevant no, to no, the question. Please. Oh, well, I was just gonna please. ask, so, one of the things that like I, you know, a lot of people bring up a lot when they're making these facile analogies is the fall of the Roman Empire. So do you like, is there like a, you know, a freshman answer that you give to students or does it just get way too complicated to give that answer? Well, it's a little complicated because I think in thinking about the fall of the Roman Empire, there is no avoiding a whole set of definitional problems that you have to put on the table before you can say anything substantive. So you have to ask what, what an empire is, what it means. There's so many different ways to approach the question. Um, for the average rural farmer living, let's say, in the middle of what is today France, did it make any difference to him and his family or to her and her family to be part of the Roman Empire or not. And there's no, I mean, that's a, that's a real question. It's not obvious that it made a substantive difference yeah. to their experience. So that would be one of the many ways to kind of, um, to address the question. There's a very famous uh, recent book that listed, uh, I think the 395 reasons that have been given in print, by the way, not just uh, like the three of us chatting, in print for the fall of the Roman Empire. And some of them are crazy. I mean, some of them are, um, I, I talked about this a little bit on Twitter, in that list that ranges from the quite serious and you have to take it seriously all the way through to the, to the wild. Uh, my favorite is, is tiredness of life. <laughs> because and I, need to, I need to pursue this and see who, yeah, exactly. Who, who made the argument that the Romans sort of collectively woke up one day and said, you know, this is, I'm bored. <laughs> the, hell the ennui of holding an right. empire together. Exactly. Right. <laughs> oh my God, um, what an amazing book title though. The ennui of empire. Yes, like, I, that sounds like Free an amazing idea. book. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Anyway, sorry. Yes. <laughs> so but you were Marcia, saying I, it's no, not Marcia, because Romans were tired. Can I give you a real answer? Can I give you a real answer? Yeah. So, I think the Roman Empire is arguably best understood as a political system defined by a centralization of authority that depended on the capacity of that central authority to collect taxes from a subject base in widely scattered territories and to administer those territories in such a way in part through legal mechanisms, in part through an army, that, that among other things permitted them to keep collecting taxes. And that really over the course of the fifth century CE, that capacity becomes attenuated to the point that the Roman central state no longer can bring enough authority to any one situation to collect tax and different groups kind of break away as a result and form what are sometimes called successor states, but we're getting now into sort of Matt's world, but smaller versions in a way of the Roman Empire that do many of the same things, that collect tax and exercise different forms of legal and ideological authority, just on a much more fragmented and smaller scale. Yeah. So I kind of pursue that way of thinking about it when I, when I, when I teach it. It's so interesting too, because I think it's like you said at the very outset, like the reality of the, the, the kind of scholarly engagement with this question is, 
is in some ways very similar to kind of the freshman level answer to that question is like, how do you define empire? Because if you need to define that before you could figure out if it's changed or if it's gone or if it's just simply different or something like that. Right, yeah, because I exactly. mean, like, you know, as you're moving, um, just, you know, dealing with kind of Rome and into the, the medieval period or something like that, like, you know, from an ideological perspective, I think it's a little bit harder to talk about kind of the, the, the end of Rome and the West or anything like that. But if you have kind of a solid definition, if you say, it's just listen, this, this, is, this is what I'm talking about. Right. Then it's, then it's re, um, you know, then it's easier to say like, okay, now it's different. Like, like you could get to a point in which it's, it's different now than it was then. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of that, you know, definitional <clears throat> impulse comes from an approach to the past that might lean more in a kind of social scientific direction than in a humanist one, um, which isn't to say that one or the other approach. which is superior, I think we all have to always embrace both, in order to then mount a kind of argument. My sense is that that's something that the social scientists have done a little bit better, maybe, than the more humanist-oriented historians. Mm. That's, I mean, gosh, didn't mean to say something quite so potentially provocative. <laughs> this is a... Yeah, I'm about yeah. to punch my screen right now after you said that. Definitely, so. yeah. <laughs> so uh, another question I have that sort of relates to the fall or if their fall even exists is how does the how does uh, I think a lot of people when they are studying ancient Rome they get into trying to compare Roman slavery to American slavery at least my American mm -hmm. history students when I mentioned slavery they're like didn't ancient Rome have slavery Native Americans have slavery what does slavery look like in ancient Rome and how did it play a part in Rome's failing economy or almost failing economy yeah it's a, it's a great question and it's a question of perennial interest uh, really for everybody, but for American students in particular, for obvious reasons. When I teach Roman slavery, I normally emphasize a few points. Uh, one, that it absolutely shares with antebellum U.S. slavery. Remarkable structural violence um, and oppression um, and, um, you know, sort of systematic, um, destruction of, of, of life. Um, but the important differences are also interesting historically. So an obvious one is that, you know, Roman slavery isn't race-based in the same way that U.S. antebellum slavery was. Now, there's a big complicated question about um, the degree to which race as such was a kind of operative category for the Romans and for the Greeks before them. I think most people would now say yes, but rarely as salient as it has been in, in modern times. Um, which is to say, in antiquity, it wouldn't necessarily have been obvious at a glance as you walked around town, you know, who was enslaved and who was and who was not. Um, the other really crucial difference, and I think arguably one of the distinctive features of the slave system at Rome, is that most enslaved persons at Rome were eventually granted manumission, were eventually freed. Oh. Now, there's some disputes about how many, what percentages. Um, there's probably an important distinction to be made here between rural slavery and hard agricultural labor, which was worse in many respects from urban or domestic slavery. And we think that the rates of manumission were probably different, but certainly in the urban and domestic context, um, we think that many, if not most enslaved persons were granted their freedom around the age of 30. What's remarkable is that at that moment, they then became full Roman citizens. And with a handful of kind of um, limitations on different capacities, they couldn't, they themselves couldn't hold elected office, for example. They were nevertheless full Roman citizens. They could vote, they could work, they could earn an income, et cetera. Um, and that's just quite a remarkable feature. So 
sociologists of slavery, um, people like Orlando Patterson, will sometimes define the Roman slave system as a quote unquote open system that provides a kind of mechanism, obviously a very violent one, for a form of upward mobility that seems to be very different from everything in the new sure. world, Caribbean slavery, new world slavery, in which manumission rates were much, much lower, and that the, the very few who were freed continued to be subordinated in all kinds of ways. Yeah. So it's this kind of interesting play of similarity, structural violence, which was real, and, and in fact, and of course, physical violence, which was shared between the two systems. But these different ways in which it plays out are also quite interesting historically. Yeah. Um, so this brings up a really interesting point, you know, and I want to, I want to, we have some really wonderful questions from the audience and I want to make sure that we, we have some, um, we have time for that. Um, and please put your questions um, in the Q&A if you have them. Um, it's about the idea of do, doing comparative history. Right. Yeah. So in this case, like Varsha was asking about kind of antebellum US and, and kind of Roman, but you know, one of the projects you're working on is about kind of Han China and, and kind of Roman Empire. So like could you talk a little bit about kind of what are the what are the challenges and what are kind of the, the what, what is the excitement about doing that kind of I mean these are these are things that kind of terrify us sometimes. It's like we learn, especially as 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 specialists, we learn one area and then the idea of having to learn like another area, like like that's that's a little bit freaky, right? So yeah. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, and that's one of the reasons I think that comparative history has been a little bit less popular among historians is that, all, you know, all of those years we spent studying and mastering one area, the thought of then doing the same thing in some other world historical area is a little bit daunting. Um, what I have found is that one can ask good comparative questions and begin to generate you know, pretty good answers at a level of generality and kind of big picture framing that doesn't necessarily require detailed knowledge. So I often say, and this is meant to kind of shock people, so I've, I have published a little bit on comparative Rome, China topics. If I took an undergraduate survey on early China now, and took a, if, I, if you give me a final exam today, uh, even before my black and tan, <laughs> I would probably get a, 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 a gentleman's B plus again, maybe an A, maybe <laughs> an A minus. In other words, not an A plus by any means. So some yeah. people sometimes say, well, how, how in the world can you pretend to publish on something that you, you know, you're just a, a, a decent undergrad level of knowledge? And I think it's because comparative work doesn't necessarily require highly specialized knowledge of, of the different cases that you're studying. Um, now, that of course runs counter to a lot of our disciplinary training and a lot of our disciplinary instincts, right? Because we, as historians, we are trained to focus on specificity, detail, local context, et cetera. And when you begin to ask kind of bigger comparative questions, you necessarily have to sort of scale up the framing and to simplify and to schematize in ways that many historians are uncomfortable with. Um, but I find it appealing, A, to learn more about another world area, uh, but B, and maybe more significantly, because it, it helps to generate new kinds of questions about Rome that I wouldn't have had otherwise. In other words, I, I, I make no pretension to say anything original or important about China. But I do think having thought about China, I might have better questions and, and I better answers about Rome. Yeah. I, I just have one follow-up question. I, I took way back when I was an undergrad, uh, a freshman, there was um, a introductory class on Rome and China. I think the person teaching it was working with you. Um, she was a Chinese art historian. And my main question was how, one of the subsets that I got really interested in is comparing Roman religion and Han religion. When you've looked at those two cases, what, what, what new things or different things did you end up learning about Roman religion? And how does Roman religion sort of work? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, that's the second question you can ignore. That's a big one. Yeah, <laughs> I, 
I mean, this is actually one of the areas, religion broadly defined, that having thought a little bit about China and thought about the question comparatively has really opened my eyes to a few things. Uh, firstly, the basic structure of kind of public or officially sanctioned religious practice in the two empires is very, very similar, which is already striking because while there were limited contacts between the two empires, they basically develop independent of one another. So any kind of big similarities that you find in both cases might be pointing to something deeper and more structural about either about empires or about, or about culture or about humanity even. So in both cases, um, there are what we would call sort of polytheistic systems of multiple gods who are invisible, who are sometimes but not always anthropomorphized, with whom some kind of communication is possible in highly kind of circumscribed and ritualized ways depending on a kind of religious knowledge that is controlled only by the few and therefore becomes an area of legitimation or authority, and it, which is kind of bound up with the um, ideological legitimation of the sort of society and state as a whole. So at that level of generality, they're remarkably similar. I think the thing that has also struck me though, is that when we teach um, Roman religion, we often have to try to get students to think away assumptions they might have about what religion is based on their modern experience, whether that's from Christianity or Judaism or Islam, they'll bring with them assumptions about, about the category of religion as such. And I used to try to make the point in the Roman context that we have to think away a lot of that because for many Romans, religion isn't really the kind of autonomous category that you can point to, but it is now, but rather it's the term always used embedded in a kind of social matrix and set of relations. In the China case, that is much more true. I mean, the Romans do talk about religion and, they, and so, you could, you could push back against what I just said. So no, 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 Roman authors talk about religion. They know what it is. They can distinguish between secular and sacred, for example. But in China, in early China, it's, it's so intrinsically bound up with philosophy and ways of seeing the world that it, it really, I think, is not an autonomous category. So that when I talk about religion in China, in early China, I always put it in scare quotes uh, for that reason. Um, that's fascinating. I, I do want to kind of like pivot if we can, because I want to, we have some really wonderful questions from the audience I want to get to. So, so welcome to the second part of Drinking with Historians, Drunk with Historians. Um, so uh, the first thing is, is, is simply an observation is that Carlos, you have the, the most amazing teaching hand gestures and I just want to compliment on you. Like I'm, <laughs> I'm taking notes for the next lecture that I have, so. Can we, can we, so but before we got on, we talked a little bit about the experience of watching yourself on Zoom. Yes. And, I mean, I, I know that I, but I, I was a little stunned. I said, oh my God, I'm really, I'm out of control. I mean, I've got like, <laughs> <laughs> if you ever want to, if you ever want to shut me up, put me in handcuffs and I'll, I won't be able to talk. It, it, it just, it just happens. Like, I mean, like I, I, I do much the same thing. I mean, like, like I have, I have Italian heritage. So like, I, I blame that, you know, so it's, it's just the yep. Mediterranean thing. And we're just, exactly. we're just all about our hands. Um, so anyway, so back to the questions. Um, uh, we have, uh, again, a number, a number of really wonderful questions. Um, Louisa has a question that I think a, a lot of us are kind of thinking is, um, and, and something that, that certainly is a medievalist and Varsha as an American has to deal with, and I know that probably you as, a, a, as someone who works in the ancient world has to deal with too, is like, how do you approach like the, the mythologized um, a, a adoption of, um, or, or kind of a valorization of the ancient world by kind of white supremacists? Like, what do, you, what do you do to kind of like, if you're thinking about like, how do I present this material or stuff like that? Um, you know, what are, your, what are your kind of strategies for engaging that? Yeah, that's a, that's a, of course, that's a pressing issue, uh, a very important one. Um, 
And my sense is that we as a field are still thinking through how best to handle that. And there's some great work that's being done. Um, I know your, your first, your, the first guest in antiquity that you had on Sarah Bond uh, has done a lot of important work in this regard. Uh, there's a great website called Pharos, P-H-A-R-O-S, uh, by another Berkeley PhD that um, systematically tracks the use of right-wing and, and racist appropriations of antiquity to, uh, to, to call them out and to, to, point, you know, to point out their, their various distortions of the historical record for their own purposes. The one challenge, though, is that the right-wing racist and white supremacist use of antiquity is frankly not always a misappropriation of that record. There are things in the record itself that they can point to to support their own, you know, uh, sure. their own agendas. So, so it's touchy in that regard. I mean, so I think the I think the best general approach is to try to combat simplistic notions of Western civilization as a kind of essential phenomenon, as a kind of reified, as if there were some kind of unbroken continuity between the white Greeks and the white Romans and whites today. That's just a horrible distortion of the historical record. So the more we can problematize the tradition, actually, the better we can get people to think critically about it. And, and you know, hopefully, hopefully sap the energy of, of mm -hmm. Greece and Rome and the West as a kind of um, symbolic or authenticating force for agendas that I think most of us, you know, re uh, reject. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's a wonderful um, essay by Donna Zuckerberg in Eidolon, which is unfortunately not publishing anymore, about um, just, you know, confronting appropriation by white supremacists with other facts isn't really useful because I mean they can marshal facts too right, right? and like you said like you know it's not always misappropriation it, it's simply like kind of recounting of history and it's just it's right. about the analysis and it's exactly. about I love what you said about like this simplistic versus kind of complicated and historians should always be complicating the question right rather than allowing these simple kind of continuity narratives that's yeah. a way just briefly that you can you can make an important connection between what it is we teach in the classroom and its real world effects. Mm -hmm. One point that I insist upon with my undergraduates is that history is an interpretive discipline. Many of them come from high school through no fault of high school teachers with the sense that history is the memorization of names and dates on a timeline. And the more facts you can commit to memory, the better historian you will be. I pitch even my introductory lectures as arguments and I operate in a kind of persuasive mode to model for them, no, 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 no. It's all about the different kinds of interpretations that you can mount. And I think that helps with combating simplistic appropriations of the past to say, no, no, this is just one version of the past and you don't have to agree with it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a great question about, um, I know it's COVID and nobody can really go to museums, but are there any museums that sort of get it right in presenting your field and don't like overly mythologize the art and the, the architecture of, of the Roman period? You know, museums, I have to say museums have gotten a lot better in the last 30 years since I started, you know, when I first started going to Europe on family vacations up through now, um, the kind of the, the didactic, mission of the museums in, uh, in the Mediterranean and Europe has really improved dramatically. And yet you still find, you know, people will post examples of stunningly retrograde descriptions of sculptures or paintings. Uh, from, I mean, I, it, it's so easy to pick on the Met. I don't want to I don't want to pick on the Met is a jewel. We all love oh, I love the Met. You know what? Of course I love do. the Met too, but like fuck New York City. They think they're so good, <laughs> great. Like <laughs> I say this as somebody from New York, so yeah. go for it. Pick on the Met. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say that the um the, within the city of Rome itself, 
the museum collections have gotten so much better at, at this didactic function and presenting the material. Um, and also in London, I think, you know, I, I'll give a shout out to the British Museum, actually. Now, they have, they have a lot to answer for, believe me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the presentation now, I think, is, is pretty good, actually, at letting people know the complex issues of heritage and um, preservation and cultural um, property that are, you know, complicated questions. So, yeah, I'll say the, I'll say the British Museum. I hope I don't come yeah. to regret that. <laughs> no. I, I understand. Uh, so I, I have a question that's not an audience question, but I think it might lead into an audience question. So I do American foreign policy. And one of the major things you read when you read international relations is everybody will throw the book Thucydides at you. Everyone will throw the history of the Peloponnesian War. Um, right. So I know you don't do the history of ancient Greece, but is there um, is there a Roman comparison to, to the the struggle between Athens and Sparta that sort of informs the same way that Thucydides tries to do about the Peloponnesian War? Um, or is the Peloponnesian War sort of unique? Well, I think it's a kind of um, neat, self-contained, schematic conflict. There's probably nothing quite like that. Um, on the Roman side, probably the closest thing that the Roman historians themselves wanted to work up into something comparable is the kind of titanic conflict for regional supremacy with Carthage, this great North African naval power in the uh, mainly in the third century BCE. And, you know, the Roman historians want to turn that into a kind of titanic battle for control over the whole Mediterranean, or at least the West, that is at least comparable to the conflict between Athens and Sparta for control of the Greek world. But structurally, they're quite different because um, what makes the conflict between Athens and its allies versus Sparta and its allies so useful as a kind of comparative case is the very different ways in which those two states were organized. Um, and you don't get quite the same difference between Rome and Carthage, um, with the possible exception that, you know, the Roman army is a big citizen army, mainly infantry based, whereas the Carthaginian military forces are largely mercenary, uh, and mainly naval. So you do get a little bit of that kind of, ooh, you know, ooh, it, this will be interesting. What happens if a big infantry power fights against a big commercial naval power? Um, but that doesn't seem to have had the same traction for later thinkers that the Peloponnesian War has had. Interesting. Okay, and that I mean, leads I, into, yeah, that leads into a question that I know the audience would probably want to know is, what are the recent books or monographs that you found interesting about ancient Rome that you would like recommend for someone who's like knows nothing about ancient Rome? Uh, for example, me. What should I read? <laughs> Well, I continue to give an answer to that question um, that I'm prepared to defend. Um, and it's a great book by oh, Mary Beard. Be good. Mary Beard, one of the, you know, one of the handful of us who is generally known outside of our narrow circles. Um, she wrote a big kind of one volume interpretive history of Rome called SPQR. That's an acronym that goes back to antiquity that stands for Senatus Populusque Romanus, the, the Senate and People of Rome. And what's remarkable about her book is that she manages between two covers, both to cover a lot of the substantive empirical material that people might be interested in, while also problematizing it right from page one and inviting the reader to think critically about that work and that tradition, um, all written in a very lively style. Um, I think it's gonna be a long time before we can better SPQR as a kind of lively, thoughtful introduction to, to ancient Rome. Okay. Um, so another question um, that the audience had also about books is um, Eileen asked about um, asterisks and obelisks. What are your thoughts? 
Yeah, you know, I haven't looked, I, I, I don't know, uh, I, I don't asterisk from my childhood, but I, I haven't gone back to it since my childhood, which I know is, a, is probably a mistake. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, in fact, take recommendations myself. I, I would like to know where, if one wants to get back into that material, where does one begin? I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I haven't looked either. I mean, like the thing about Asterix and Obelix, which I, which I find so, so interesting as a medievalist, right, is that is the Romans are the bad guys, right? Is right. that, you know, the native Gauls are the, the good guys, Asterix and Obelix and stuff like that. And so like how it plays into in a, in a very kind of subtle and, and kind of playful way and sometimes not even very oblique obliquely about um, this idea of kind of 19th century nation nation building is that it's not tied in, in France to Rome. It's tied to the, the, like you mentioned, kind of the successor states right. is that there, there's a French identity which which survives through Rome, like yes. kind of despite that. Um, right. And I mean, that that's a very kind of quick reading of that. But I think it's 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 interesting how that's that's participating in kind of a scholarly discourse as well. So. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's there's a I mean, even going even going back to antiquity itself and even going back to prominent Roman authors, there's this kind of dialectic between Romer, Romans as civilizers and bringers of culture and Romans as kind of bandits and bad guys. And the Romans themselves played with that dichotomy. And I think it continues to this day. And yeah, and I think so. I yeah. think those those works are a great kind of artistic expression of that of that issue. Yeah. So uh, speaking of, go ahead. go ahead, Matt, sorry. Oh, no, I was, I was just gonna, gonna make the, <laughs> please. We're gonna keep talking at the same time. So I'm gonna- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So I was just gonna ask, uh, speaking of pop culture, are there any like, Roman figures or maybe not that famous or whatever, are there any like biopics that you haven't seen yet? Because I know there's like a lot of huge movie industry about like ancient Rome, there's TV shows about it. Is there something that you still haven't seen that you that you'd love to see? Well, um, I've seen a lot. Uh, and <laughs> so HBO Rome and, and Gladiator are two recent things that I that I have enjoyed. Um, of course, we have to give a a huge shout out uh, to the old BBC series I Claudius. Highly recommended. If you just you you're not going to do better than that. Um, the um, the Spartacus movie um, is another classic. Um, oh, okay. Here's one. I don't think I I don't think I've seen Quo Vadis, which I think is the best most commercially successful Roman movie ever. Um, Ben-Hur I've seen, that's great. Um, Quo Vadis though. I was in a trivia game recently in which I almost single-handedly brought my whole team to, well, in fact, I did. We came in last place. I think it's because of me. <laughs> <laughs> One of the questions was, what's the most commercially successful Rome-based movie of all time? And everybody on my team was saying, it's Quo Vadis. I said, no, 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 no. It's gotta be um, Fellini's Satyricon. And they were grad students and they said, well, we should just let the professor have his way. <laughs> and the answer, the answer was Quo Vadis. <laughs> I still haven't lived that down. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. You owe them so many drinks. It's just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's something that, that I've really loved and we haven't, um, you know, I think it's kind of passed through pop culture now, but the, the HBO series Rome, yeah. um, which, which existed for, for several years, I think it was canceled simply because it was too too expensive. To that was the only thing. reason, yeah. Yeah. It, was, it um, cost like just, millions of dollars per episode or something, right? Like, yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. Which, which I actually like now, if I were made now, I mean, like thinking about Game of Thrones and stuff like that, like it probably wouldn't have even flinched at if it was as popular as it was. But, um, you know, what was it about that? I mean, there was something about kind of the everyday life of Rome. I mean, it focuses on if you're unfamiliar with it and you should all go out and watch it like right now, um, yeah. these kind of kind of mid-level or even kind of lower class kind of uh, soldiers. And because as they experience these kind of pivotal moments in the transition between the Republic and Empire, but like, what, what was it about it that, that you, you kind of liked so much? It was, it was really well done. Um, you know, I have, this isn't the kind of scholarly hat critique mode, but I thought their characterization of the famous people was mostly impeccable. Mm -hmm. um, and I, always, I would always begin here with Mark Antony, perfect. 
um, that will never that will never be surpassed. That's the best Antony you will ever see, especially season two. Um, Caesar, they nailed, just perfect. Some of the other figures, so Cicero is a great kind of Roman intellectual and scholar. He never had a great military career. They make Cicero a little too bumbling and meek for my taste. They, I mean, he had a little of that too, for sure. But it's what you say, Matt. It's the giving us the lens of these kind of world historical transitions, largely from the perspective of regular people. And they capture that very well. Hmm. The thing that I sort of sometimes will point out to students as a historian that, they, that I think they got very well, related a little bit to my gladiator point, is the texture of daily life in the city of Rome. Because what is shocking is that um, at that period, there was no police force. There was no organized institution or personnel for security in the city of Rome, which had a population maybe as high as a million people. And you think, well, how can that possibly be? If you have a million people crammed together and no police, it must have been a free for all must have been the Wild West. And that's, I think, exactly what it was. And the show captures that insanity and chaos of a huge urban center with no police. I think they get that very well. Wait, okay, so I know this is, we only have two minutes left and this is way too short of you to answer this, but there's no police. And again, that sounds like a fascinating world to the study. And obviously some people are fighting for, for you know, the decrease of the police force today, but, how does yeah, law that, and yeah. how does law and crime work though? Like, so is are there still courts? Yes. Yeah. So um, there. So they have a conception of crime, um, and they have a legal structure to to try cases. But we think they tended in that period, prior to the um, the rise of a kind of monarchic system under Julius Caesar's heir, Augustus. In this period, there was a kind of court system, but mainly for elite cases and you know treason and high level murder and inheritance problems. But at the level beneath that, probably less pervasive. And as a result, one's security and livelihood often depended on attachment to a powerful figure in the neighborhood. So it's a highly patronage-based world where the guy who can bring more resources to the fight is going to have more authority and esteem and honor. And if you can attach yourself to that guy, then he'll protect you. But then, you know, different guys will compete with one another to be the big guy on the, on the block. Um, and so it, it was probably, violence was probably endemic. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. That's really interesting because I'm thinking about like, and it's been a long time since I've watched Rome, but I mean, that, that's something that Rome seems to capture very well is this patronage system. Yeah. Right. It's the, the yeah. way that they try to attach themselves to somebody else, right? To give yeah. a little bit more kind of uh, power and why that's important. Um, we do have one more minute. So I'm just going to ask a tiny question um, that, that, that Richard has is about the idea of, of being Roman. Like, what did it mean? And how did it kind of change over time? His, his question is specifically about like, how did, when did people kind of stop thinking about themselves as Roman? But maybe I'm gonna, I'm gonna take kind of webcaster's privilege and, and pull us back and say like, like, what did it mean under the high empire to actually be a Roman? Like versus somebody who lived maybe in Rome but wasn't themselves a Roman. A distinctive- And remember, you have history. about one minute to answer that. <laughs> yes. So. There is a juridical definition and a cultural definition. The juridical definition is black and white. It's a question of citizenship. And citizenship is a set of privileges and obligations that is legally conferred. And this is an important marker of one's belonging to this world. You, you either had Roman citizenship with rights and obligations or not. So that's one simple and, and meaningful way to answer the question, are you a Roman or not? But then there's the much more complicated question of are you a Roman culturally? Do you read Virgil? 
Do you put your toga on the right way? Do you host dinner parties in ways that would be recognized by your peers as correct? And what people have been saying, which I think is right, is that the Romans themselves, the elite literary Romans, argued about that all the time. And one response to the question is that it is precisely the capacity to participate in the debate about whether or not you're a Roman that makes you a Roman. Whoa, that is very meta. Uh, <laughs> it's also a, a great way to end because I think that's also, again, I don't want to make a facile analogy here, but that's also sort of what it is to be an American. Like if you yeah, are, yeah. if you are able to jump into the conversation and be like, yeah, I'm an American. I'm going to argue with you about why I'm an American. It makes you an American. So yeah. I, I think that's a great way to sort of end on that. Um, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming with us. And thank you for, for all the questions that we had for all the audience. And I I think I'm going to buy SPQR. I think I'm, I think yeah, I'm going to read you it. Should. Yeah. yeah. Recommended. Um, yeah, I was I was telling you on Twitter that I I actually read Gibbon's book just because I wanted to see what the big deal was, and I was like uh -huh. largely confused because I don't understand any of this. But yeah. uh, it was it was good to hear from you that apparently you you should read it at least like once. Apparently, just exactly. Yes. See what he says. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. um, and appreciate his prose. Yes, that was what I enjoyed the most about it. Yeah. 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 Um. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you, Carlos, and uh, go, Bears, um, go Bears. Because all three go of Bears. us are Bear alma mater, right? All three of us went That's to right. uh, Berkeley for undergrad. I'm going to Berkeley for grad school. Uh, so did Matt. So yeah, cheers. Go Bears. Cheers. Cheers. Go Bears. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.